The Matt Busby story begins far away from the glamour of Wembley. He was born here, in the Lanarkshire pit village of Orbiston, in 1909. Today, the main street is renamed Busby Road. I was born in a pitman's cottage. And the doctor who delivered me said, a footballer has come to this house this day. He may have said that about most of the boys with whom he delivered. <laughs> but in my case, it very nearly was proved wrong. Busby was to experience sorrow early in his life. His father and all his uncles were killed in the First World War. The need to supplement the family income prevented the young Busby from training to be a schoolteacher. When he's 15 years of age, he seen the uh, hard times my mother was having rearing six of us, four, four sisters, Matt and I. And he left our ladies' high school at Motherwell at 15 years of age to go down a pit to help my mother out. He's, he's never so. regretted not only been never been a school teacher, he's, he's never regretted going down the pits, although he thinks it, it still taught him something in life, to be grateful for any little small mercies. Professional football presented one of the few alternatives to coal mining, and Busby was keen to emulate two other local players, Alex James and Huey Gallagher. The ambition seemed a rather forlorn one, during Busby's association with the local Hibs team, and the family planned to emigrate to the United States. My application for a visa at that time was delayed. And that delay changed the whole course of my life. Instead of emigrating to America, I emigrated to Manchester. <laughs> Manchester City signed Busby in February 1928. He received a weekly wage of five pounds during the season and four pounds during the summer. But his early days in English football were not particularly a source of happiness. For after two years, I was playing so badly that I almost, was almost in despair. Dr. Johnson said one time that much may be made of a Scotsman if he is caught young. I had decided that if much was to be made of me, it would appear I would have to try some other career other than football. Then suddenly, in an emergency, I was called upon to play right half-back in a Northern Midweek League game. And in that position, and from that moment, success came to me. Success with Manchester City was confirmed in the club's 2-1 victory over Portsmouth in the 1934 FA Cup final. Manchester City equalise. Cotton goes up half a point and a rainbow runs right through Manchester. The winning goal. Look at that Portsmouth player taking the ball out of the net. Hasn't his back got a sweet expression? The cup goes north. Two years after this, Busby was transferred to Liverpool. He was made the captain and is remembered as having had a paternal attitude toward the younger players. To them, he looked more like a bank manager than a professional footballer as he walked to Anfield in a fawn overcoat and a trilby smoking a pipe. The war years revealed his instinctive qualities of leadership to an even greater extent. He attained the rank of company sergeant major. He also represented Scotland a number of times in matches arranged for the Red Cross. While serving in Italy, he was put in charge of the army team. After the war, he could have returned to Liverpool and taken a coaching job at Anfield. He chose instead to accept Manchester United's offer of a manager's office and an annual salary of £750. The offer was somewhat of an exaggeration. 
German bombs had destroyed the office and reduced much of the ground to rubble. Matt Busby, aged 35, arrived to find Old Trafford in ruins. It was not an easy assignment. The ground had been blitzed. There had an overdraft at the bank. What is more, I had very little experience. I had no experience as a manager. And I felt they were taking a great risk in appointing me. All I had, apart from playing experience, were certain ideas as to what the manager should do, faith in those ideas, and faith in the future of the club. Busby's first signing proved to be the most important one he made. He recruited Jimmy Murphy as his assistant. Murphy, a former player for West Bromwich Albion and Wales, had met Busby during wartime service. The iron Scottish diplomat and the Welsh drill sergeant were to become one of the game's great managerial partnerships. Busby, later renowned for his emphasis on youth, bought the balding, ageing Jimmy Delaney from Celtic for £4,000. It was a masterstroke. Delaney provided a supply line for Jack Rowley and Stan Pearson, one of the most successful post-war goal-scoring partnerships. Rowley, complemented by Pearson's subtlety, scored 175 goals in 359 league matches. But the most influential figure in the first of Busby's three united sides was the captain. Johnny Carey, who was the Republic of Ireland player and, and at that time was an immense player. Actually, he played in every position in the club except goalkeeper. But he was an inside forward and I converted him to a full back. And, of course, from there, he was immense. And uh, not only that, he was a great help to me and a great captain. United were runners-up in the first division four times before the league title came Busby's way in 1952. The team is best remembered for winning the FA Cup in 1948, defeating Blackpool in the final. The old Lancashire finalists take the field at Wembley. Manchester United in dark shirts, Blackpool in white. It's the North's big day. Sunshine warms the stadium and 100,000 spectators settle themselves for an afternoon's enjoyment as the King greets the players with a friendly handshake. Manchester kickoff. Renowned slow starters, their match-winning attack seems to have lost the rhythm that has brought them along the road to Wembley. A close duel between Manchester's Johnny Carey and Blackpool's Water Ricket number 11 is highlight number one in a thrill-packed match. Highlight number two comes when Stan Mortensen is tripped in the penalty area and referee Barrick awards Blackpool a spot kick. As the crowd rise to cheer, Eddie Schimmel drives it home to give the Seasiders the lead. Manchester's Jack Rowley walking the ball into the net to equalise provides highlight number three. Blackpool settling down quicker than Manchester are overcoming their Wembley nerves. From a free kick and a seemingly impossible angle, Stanley Mortensen whips in a goal to give Blackpool the half-time lead. Blackpool kick off, confidently hoping that their 2-1 lead will bring them football's most coveted prize. Just to make sure, their skipper, Harry Johnson, number four, tries a long shot that doesn't come off, and the ball trickles out. But now Manchester's attack, which has scored 95 goals this season, swings into its best style. From Johnny Morris's well-placed free kick, the fans cheer Jack Rowley's headed equaliser. With the score at 2 all, Blackpool are again on the attack. Stanley Matthews, who has been shut out effectively, beats Manchester's Johnny Aston, but the seaside is finishing his poor. Charlie Mitten, number 11, starts off United's winning attack, and from Rowley's pass, Stan Pearson scores the goal that gives Manchester the cup. The King hands the silver trophy to skipper Johnny Carey. Their 4-2 victory, snatched in the last few minutes, gives Manchester United the reward they richly deserve. Some contend that the 1948 team was Busby's finest. He had already established an intelligent approach to team management. 
This was acknowledged when he was invited to take charge of the British Olympic football team. He had set himself high standards to follow and a reputation as an innovative manager. He was very different. In other words, he was always with the players and understanding the players. And uh, when we assembled together at the cliff, um, Matt Busby was there in his tracksuit and, and football boots on and everything. And uh, he used to show us, not only teach us what we were to do, but he could demonstrate himself because he was young enough to do that. And this was very new? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This was... Uh, we didn't have manage. The manager was the chap who was in the office, but Matt was never one for being in the office. He didn't like that. Busby was once asked about a memorial. He said that he already had one. The three great teams he created for United in 23 years as manager. He considered the babes of the 1950s to have been the greatest. My first idea was to try and build on young boys, young players, and bring them up in the club atmosphere and the feeling for the club and uh, character-wise, loyalty-wise. We had uh, won a championship in 52, and I felt at the time that there was need for a change. Some of the players were getting over the top. And uh, I remember I was going to play a, a friendly game in Kilmarnock, and I, I started ticking over my mind now, should I put a few of these lads in or shouldn't I? And uh, I remember walking around the Toon Golf Course, where probably you've <laughs> played golf in the past. And I spent a, a morning going around thinking, 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 will I do it? Will I? And eventually I decided, and I put five or six of the young boys in, and it was at Huddersfield, the first match. Mm -hmm. And we made a draw. We played Arsenal the following Saturday. We managed to beat Arsenal. And from then on, it seemed to take a pattern. We had a collection, really, of, of players of great talent at the time, and they were dedicated. They wanted to play, and they wanted to create, and they wanted to win. The first of the home-reared players to be promoted was Roger Byrne, who was to become the distinguished captain of the fledgling side. From his early days, he matured so much. He did mature, Roger. And he actually become a very good leader, really, Roger Byrne. His early days didn't suggest that. He become a very good captain. And uh, not only that, a great fullback. Whereas I think if Tom Finney and Stan Matthews were talking about fullbacks, they didn't have met much success with. In fact, I never saw either one of the two of them play well against Roger Byrne. A tremendous view of a field, uh, where to play a ball, and he used the ball very accurately. And as I say, a, a, his positional senses, he, he seemed to smell some situations, and it was always there in the interception. United won the FA Youth Cup for five successive seasons from 1953. The babes were thriving. Eddie Coleman, it was said, shimmied and sent the grandstand the wrong way. David Pegg was difficult to stop on the left wing. Dennis Violet would go on to eclipse Jack Rowley's club record. Liam Whelan's ball skills attracted offers from Brazil. Busby was also prepared to buy to strengthen the blend. Tommy Taylor was signed from Barnsley for the odd sum of £29,999. I says, well, putting £30,000 in this lad's said, make put him under pressure. I'll give you 29999 He says, all right, we'll accept that. So that was uh, Tommy Taylor, the start of Tommy Taylor here. And, of course, we all know the greatness of the, the player and his brilliant head work and the contribution he put, made to the team. Above all was the incomparable Duncan Edwards. One day I was talking with Joe Mercer, and Joe had, at that time, had been, uh, he was captain of Arsenal, and at that time he, he had taken the, the English schoolboys on for a week, doing a bit of coaching with them in Brown about Blackpool. I think it was about 1950, maybe a little later than that. And there was D David Pegg there, Parry, Roy Parry, remember, Duncan Edwards, oh, uh, Alex Farrell, Mark Jones, oh... 
such talent there. And that